Hello, regular trees. <laughs> Welcome to Mystery of Crocodile Island, number 55. What is this, episode 8? Probably. Okay. Well, aren't you a regular Nancy Drew? We sure hope so, and we hope you are too. Join us as we talk Nancy Drew cover to cover and click to click. Welcome to Regular Nancy Drew. Cool. Yeah, welcome. Should we do our three words? Oh, I don't even know where to start. (laughs) Weird. Yeah, I was just going to say bizarre. So So bizarre. bizarre. But I guess, you know, crocodiles. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. There's crocodiles, lots of crocodiles. So weird crocodile. Florida. Florida. Yeah. I guess if you have a Florida book, it's got to be weird to begin with. So (laughs) this is the Florida man of Nancy Drew mystery stories. Every time I thought I knew where this was going, I was (laughs) completely wrong. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I I literally don't know where to start with this because there's just... There's just so much, there's so much, but it's also like so bizarre that it almost doesn't even make sense to like right. try to explain <laughs> Like you just have, you just have to be there. This is one of those books where it's like, you just got, you just got to read it to mm-hmm. understand, but you know, we'll do our best. We'll do our best here. <laughs> so, I mean, do you want to talk about the cover just for a second? Yeah. <laughs> so I think I know what scene ah, this too. is in the story. <laughs> I think there is just one cover of this story because it is a later one in the series. Um, I think this one was published in 1978 and it was written by Harriet Stratemeyer Adams. And I think she was the only author of this one. No revision or anything, right? Correct. Yes, I believe that is correct. And I think, you know, I think it kind of (laughs) shows. Yeah. (laughs) A little bit. And I, I don't know if, I mean, she was also, you know, she'd been doing this for a long time and Mm -hmm. I'm sure at a certain point this became kind of really formulaic. Yes. So it probably became really easy to just kind of throw whatever out there. Right. It doesn't, doesn't have to connect. Just put it in the story. We have to put one out this year. Let's, let's get it done. Yeah. But so the cover, yeah, I think it's supposed to be the scene where Nancy goes to, like, uh, the neighbor's, like, weird zoo situation. Mm. And the trainer, like, invites Nancy to throw a piece of meat for the crocodile. Nancy jumps into the cage for some unknown reason. Right. <laughs> and um, and then she sees a guy, while she's doing that, she sees a guy, like, peeking out from, like, the woods at her. Mm. But nowhere... In the book is the man peeking out of the woods of them holding a miniature crocodile. Like what it why? <laughs> why does he have that? <laughs> it it's just I just don't understand the small crocodile situation. It just it just seems like as an illustrator, why would you include that small detail for no reason? Like it would have been exactly the same if it was just his hand on the tree trunk. Right. <laughs> And it also looks so ridiculous. Like, who's just carrying around a tiny, a tiny crocodile with them as they're spying on people in the woods? What is it? It's like a a mini me, or not a mini me? Uh, the Doctor Evil and his cat situation. Is this oh, just yeah. like the evil man's like pet baby crocodile that just like rides around on his shoulder everywhere? Is that mm-hmm. what this is supposed to be? Apparently, we never find out either. No, because it's not because it's not in the book. Right. It's just it's just the artist's rendition of the scene, and apparently it included a miniature or a baby crocodile. Interesting creative liberty there. Yeah, and also Nancy seems to be in like a swamp scenario instead of a you know like alligator enclosure. <clears throat> so I don't know. Maybe this is supposed to be like a combination of of things, like a a, a visne kind of the way crumbling walls. Uh, thing was but it's it's just a weird cover and the illustrations throughout are not any better no (laughs) i'm sure we'll talk about one at the i think closer to the end with ned in it with the snakes oh yeah (laughs) he looks like yeah he looks like he's like 60 years old (laughs) yeah the the like the lines in his face 
<laughs> he looks like he's like like dying, like he's like yes. withering away. <laughs> but I just I just can't get over their outfits in every single illustration because for some reason in every single illustration, Nancy, Bess, and, and George are, are all dressed exactly alike. Mm-hmm. They're all wearing the same clothes. And whenever they're in the boat, the boat scenes, like the boat illustrations, they're wearing like what I can only describe as like a sailor outfit, but like a like a French sailor, like long sleeved, like really big ridged hats. And they're all wearing them. Yeah. And I'm like, did y'all just like go to the same store and like buy these all at the same time? Or is there some kind of like boating dress code that clearly <laughs> Anyway, so it seems like the same the same person who did the the other really bad illustrations in Crumbling Wall. Do we know who illustrated these? I don't. I don't. Which is kind of a bummer. I think really should always include that in the copyright. Mm-hmm. I don't know why they don't. But yeah, no, I just thought it, the just just overall the illustrations in general were bizarre. Bizarro. Right. Anyway. Okay, yeah, let's let's get into it because yeah. I have to start talking about some of this stuff. I'm going to explode. I'm going to talk about it all right now. There's so much. There's <laughs> let's so go. Much. Okay, so basically, we start off with Carson telling Nancy, Bess, and George about like an old college buddy of his named Roger Gonzalez, who is having trouble with a company that he owns part of, or he owns like stock of. He owns some part of it, but he he's not he does not play a role in the running of it. Mm-hmm. It's a crocodile farm on a place called Crocodile Island in the Florida Keys, right? In the Florida Keys, yes, mm-hmm. Key Biscayne okay. in particular, which I looked up, and it's a real place, it's mm-hmm. a real thing. And so apparently, Mister Gonzalez just thinks that they're up to something on Crocodile Island, and he's not he doesn't really know what's going on. He just says like something quote unquote dishonest. Mm-hmm. is happening there and so he wants carson's help investigating and carson obviously gets nancy to do it as per his use mo he does have two business partners hal gemler and george sacco they've been up to shady business they've been trying to get him to sell out his shares of the company so like you said he just wants them to investigate for him <clears throat> so we don't really get any details right up front except that there's just some kind of mystery in florida and nancy has to go investigate but we do also have this really weird start where apparently Carson asked George to pick up a small rubber crocodile from like a joke shop in River Heights, yeah. which one I thought was weird. Why would Carson ask George to run an errand for him? Whatever. And also he just wanted it. <laughs> he wanted them to get it so that they could look at it. Basically and have like a sense of what a crocodile looks like versus an alligator, which does it matter when one's right in front of you? Like, <laughs> get out of the enclosure, Nancy. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so so there's that. But that is not the weirdest part. The weirdest part is that they, like, get, they get the rubber crocodile, mm-hmm. look at it in the little box or whatever, and, like, poke at it and say, like, oh, what a good, what a good likeness of a crocodile. What a nice little, you know, toy or whatever. And then they realize that, the crocodile starts to climb out of the box. They realize this is an actual legitimate baby crocodile. Right. Which I just have so many questions. Well, they don't notice until the phone call. Cause they get oh, a phone right. call from the joke shop and the guy on the phone is like, um, <laughs> that's actually a real crocodile that I accidentally sold you and you need to bring it back right now or you're going to prison. And they're like, Oh my gosh, what do you mean? And they turn around in the box and the crocodile is like crawling out and escaping. So, <laughs> right. So I just have so many questions. I just have so many questions that never get answered. And I'm like, why? Why is a joke shop selling? Why does a joke shop have a baby crocodile? Right. They say that they bought it from Crocodile Island, which which we think is supposed to be important, except it turns out not to be important at all. Right. They never mention it again, mm-hmm. which is, you know, we're, we're getting quite a, We've gotten quite a few of those those moments in the past few but whatever okay but why are you buying baby crocodiles from crocodile island why you're what are you selling them as jokes like what what (laughs) maybe they're gonna be people's pets but that doesn't seem i don't know yeah yeah yeah. anyway 
so so that happens. They, I mean, nothing. Toko barks at it, but they they get it and they put it back in the box. It's fine. It's not a big deal. And then they head off to Florida, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Go to the airport. <laughs> On the or once they arrive to the airport, they get a phone call at the airport, which is like just a whole other universe. But they get a message from Carson basically saying, "Oh, the trip might be canceled because he doesn't need you anymore." Or what, yeah. what happened exactly? Mister Gonzalez is like going to cancel the trip, but I don't think we really know why. We just know that Carson got a call from him and that they might may not be going anymore. So Carson arranges for Nancy Bess and George to instead stay with his other friends in Florida, the Cosgroves. And it's just like, how many friends in Florida does Carson have? Mm -hmm. Multiple friends. And I guess they're just, I guess they just have a lot of friends. I guess it's not restricted to River Heights, them knowing everybody. They just know everybody in the world. Right. Whatever. They, he arranges for them to go stay with the Cosgroves and their 16 year old son, Danny. And it's at this point, they decide to use assumed names because they're worried about like someone threatening uh, Mr. Gonzalez because Carson thinks that's why he tried to cancel the trip because someone threatened him or like found out he was doing this or like hiring these detectives. So, right. And so they decide it would be prudent for them to not advertise that that's who they are. Mm -hmm. I think this is the first time they use an alias, isn't it? Or that we've I seen have, so far. So. I have not seen, I've not, we, in our reading, there's been no alias, but they go as the Boontons. And so I guess they're all supposed to be sisters, Anne, Elizabeth, and Jackie Boonton. And Nancy is Anne Boonton. Did you know that Bess was originally Elizabeth? That's how they introduced her in the original Shadow Ranch. Oh. It's Elizabeth Marvin, but she goes by Bess. And Interesting. Well, I guess Elizabeth is like a family name for them or whatever, because Beth Raleigh is Elizabeth also, too. Yeah. Yeah. So. Interesting. It's also a very common girl's name for the right. 30s and the 50s. So, <laughs> And every time in history. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they go to the airport or they get to the airport in Florida. And then they are immediately met by people who introduce themselves at the Cosgrove, as the Cosgroves, who drive them to their house let them up into their rooms. And then as soon as they've done that, they realize that they are locked into their rooms and that mm -hmm. in fact, they were not the Cosgroves, but they must have been kidnapped by people <laughs> who were pretending to be the Cosgroves. Mm -hmm. Which would mean that those people would have had to have been listening in on Carson's phone call to Nancy. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't make any sense. We know that they had a way to tap Mr. Gonzalez's phone. Right. How did they have a way to tap Carson's phone or the airport phone? Because those are the only other options. Anyway. It is a plot hole. It is a major plot hole. That is the first plot hole that I noticed. Right. Um, yeah, there's going to be more. There's going to be more. <laughs> um, but yeah, it doesn't make sense as to how they were able to do this really. But that's what happens. <laughs> but Nancy picks a lock. I added that to the skill list. She knows how to pick locks mm -hmm. um, and is able to escape. George climbs out of the window, but Nancy frees best. They're able to get out. They get their mm -hmm. luggage because also the people who kidnapped them just kidnapped them, locked them into the rooms and left. Yeah, they just leave the property. <laughs> and they walk like a mile to the nearest neighbor and use that phone to call the police. It is this whole thing. Right. And then they take a cab to the real Cosgrove's house. So nothing happened to them. They were fine. They don't meet the people who kidnapped them. There, there was no like consequences aside from them having to walk a really long time from them being kidnapped. Right. There doesn't seem to be a reason for them to have been kidnapped because they left. So they didn't seem to be like they were going to kill them or... I, I just don't understand what the point dead, Thinking that they're locked in these rooms <laughs> and can't get out. and like Forever. <laughs> they'll dehydrate eventually like <laughs> oh my gosh but yeah so then uh as soon as they get to the cosgroves they clean up or whatever and then they decide to um boat on out to crocodile island with danny the cosgrove 16 year old son who apparently is a really good boatsman and then they get to the island and they go on a tour they also meet a dog named Efi, which apparently is a uh, seminal for a dog yeah, and they just take a tour of the island. Then an alarm sounds. And they're, they're like, everybody get off the island. Yeah, and Nancy's like, oh, is a crocodile loose or whatever? And they're like, maybe. You just have to go. So they're like, 
but not before you register. Make sure you register with the front desk. Did you register with the front desk? And they're like, no. And so they put down all their fake names and someone takes a picture of them. Yeah. They leave Crocodile Island and they notice that they're being followed by another boat on their way out. Yes, called the Whisper. This is where they learn that Matt Carmen and Brooke Tobin are are the ones in the boat. They don't know who's who, but that's who's following them. Right. And because like while they're while they're leaving, they decide like to circle the island and the uh, these guys in the boat are like really weirdly vaguely threatening them just be like you better leave here or you'll be sorry. Or... Get away. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, um, okay, weird, whatever, bye. And yeah, they go back to the Cosgrove house. And Danny's father, Mr. Cosgrove, just has a register of like boats in the area. Mm-hmm. But not even boats in the area because they look up the boat, The Whisper, which is the name of the boat. And they find that, yeah, it belongs to Matt Carmen and Breck Tobin. But they live in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. And this boat's from Bridgeport, Connecticut. So how, I'm sorry, does this, does this guy just have a record of all boats in like the continental U.S.? Yeah, he must. So that's plot hole number two, in my opinion. I just don't understand how that works. I don't know. I don't know a lot about uh, record keeping of uh, boats. So maybe it's just this thing that I'm unaware of. But it just seems a little far-fetched to me. Right. Anyway, then Carson calls and uh, sets up a meeting with Nancy and Mr. Gonzalez at his golf club. Mm -hmm. And so Nancy goes to go there and she takes certain pains not to be followed. Um, But when she gets to the club, she finds out that there is a girl already there who has said that she is Nancy Drew slash Ann Boonton. And is already meeting with Mr. Gonzalez. So she like interrupts this meeting. Mr. Gonzalez comes out and is like, oh, or you're actually Nancy Drew. And that girl wasn't. And by the time they go back, the girl has gotten away. Basically, right. there's a little bit of like a chase scene where they like try to track her down. But it, it really amounts to nothing. Right. Um, and she just gets away. Right. Then they, they, they do sit down and have this meeting between Nancy and Mr. Gonzalez. And he tells her that his two business partners have been making like random trips to Mexico and they, the crocodiles have been going missing from the island and they are trying to get him to sell his shares of the company to them. Right. And so Nancy tells Mr. Gonzalez that she thinks his phone is tapped because um, that's how these bad guys or whatever were interfering with Nancy's travel plans basically and i know it's so silly and um yeah and that's basically the the sum of their lunch meeting while they are at this lunch meeting george and danny go off in the boat what did i write that the little skiff boat thing yeah oh borrowed boat no borrowed borrowed boat boat. because they don't want anyone from the (laughs) island to recognize their boat that they registered right so they use their neighbor's boat And then Nancy comes home, and while George and Danny are off in that boat, Bess, Nancy, and Mrs. Cosgrove go to her friend's house slash estate, which is also actually a zoo. This so happens. (laughs) And then, so they they go there, and they see all kinds of animals. There's like a flamingo or whatever. Um, And then they go to see the crocodiles named Lord and Lady Charming, which I thought was super cute. (laughs) So cute. And while they were like watching the crocodiles, some boys paddle up and start throwing rocks at the crocodiles. And Nancy tries to scare them away. And she does, but then they come back and they throw rocks. And one of the rocks hits one of the crocodiles in the eye. And we learn, yeah, that crocodiles' eyes are really sensitive. And so they like call for a keeper to come over And he jumps into the enclosure, flips over the crocodile with a pole, and Mm -hmm. applies salve to his eyes. Salve. He flips over the other crocodile so that it has to, like, struggle to get back on its belly. (laughs) And in that time, he can tend to the other crocodile. And he doesn't want it to, like, come over and bother them. (laughs) I find this to be plot hole number three. Yes. Because I am, like, 99% sure that you cannot just... One, flip a crocodile over with a pole. And two, that a crocodile is going to struggle whilst on its back to roll over. Crocodiles do this thing called the death roll where they literally roll to kill their prey. Like that's part of their whole movement. Right. (laughs) 
<laughs> and I've seen the Crocodile Hunter, and I've seen the Irwins show on the Discovery mm. Channel. My uncle was on Gator 911 back when that was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a gator in the church. <laughs> and it, it takes them like 10 guys to jump on one crocodile to hold it down so that right. it doesn't come at them. Also, what, what salve is going to help an eye that's been injured? <laughs> not It's not infected or anything. Well, not yet at least, but. I don't know. This, this book is so weird. It's so strange. There's some things that are peppered in there and you think like, oh, this is going to be relevant to the mystery. No, it's just for Nancy's own learning purposes. She <laughs> just needed to know that crocodiles have sensitive eyes. Like, <laughs> okay. Right. Um, so then that's that's their trip and then they leave. <laughs> so they go, they go back to the Cosgrove's house and George and Danny have returned and they tell Nancy that they overheard a message through the radio on the whisper. So they were able to drive up really close to the whisper in their borrowed boat. And they heard a message over the radio that said tonight at eight. That's it. They don't know what it means or whatever, but Nancy's like, great. We'll go out there at eight. And so they do that. So they follow the whisper out that evening and see it approach a freighter. And then a freighter that lowers a pine box that best thinks looks like a coffin mm -hmm. into the whisper. <laughs> and we don't know, we don't know what it is or whatever, but Nancy's like, oh, is there, is there a crocodile in there? What is that? They don't really come to a consensus. They don't think it's large enough for a crocodile or whatever. So um, they want to follow the whisper farther, but they don't know where it's going. And also they um, don't have enough fuel. So they need to head back. They're going to wait at Crocodile Island to see if it comes back to Crocodile Island. It doesn't come back to Crocodile Island and they just go home. Right. <laughs> and then the next day they decide to go back to the zoo because apparently the trainer is going to be there. And this guy apparently trains the animals to do cool tricks and they want to see all the cool tricks. <laughs> so they go back this is where the racism starts right you know i thought it started off kind of not terribly and but then well i'm sure we'll talk about this more in depth after we finish oh, yeah. our summary but it gets it gets so bad but anyway um they meet joe who is native american and from the seminole tribe which is a tribe that's really makes up a lot of what is now florida and so they meet him and he, yeah, this is when he gives Nancy the meat to feed the crocodile. She, he, he just wants her to like throw it to the crocodile from outside of the crocodile's enclosure. Instead, Nancy says, oh, you know, I can't get the right angle on this, this meat. It's not going to make it into the crocodile's mouth. I'm just going to jump in. I'm just going to jump into the crocodile's area or whatever. And, and it'll be fine. And, the trainer, one, doesn't immediately react to this, which is like, if your job is to make sure these animals are safe, maybe you should be like, what are you doing? Get out. Get out. Uh, get right. out. <laughs> but whatever. She, he lets her and she does that. Oh, she almost gets eaten, I guess. Right. Whatever. <laughs> and like a crocodile approaches her. So she, because she loses her thought or something, she like, she gets so entranced in watching the crocodile and she's so interested in it or whatever that she forgets that it's dangerous, that it's dangerous. <laughs> and the crocodile approaches her too swiftly and she wasn't expecting it. And so she has to like kind of run to get out of the enclosure. And it's like, they can <sighs> run really fast, Nancy. What are you thinking? It just doesn't seem like a Nancy move. It seems like Nancy would be cautious. Mm -hmm. With a wild animal that she doesn't like, she doesn't know a lot about. Seems like a George move to. Yes, to and, it mm -hmm. seems like a total George move. It would have made so much more sense if it was George jumping into the enclosure. Bess freaking out about George, but while Bess is freaking out, Nancy sees the guy watching them. That would, that have, would have been sense. <laughs> so much better. But anyway. Yeah, she jumps out. She mentions that she sees a guy watching them. They kind of follow him into the woods to try to chase him. Joe says he found some, like, footprints, but they lose him at the water. <laughs> Do you want to talk about the racism right now? or <laughs> Let's hold off because there's so much of it. And there's we'll get really more in a bit. So <laughs> Okay, okay, yeah. So we'll just we'll just move on and we'll 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 come back and, and talk about it later. Cause it, re it really does. It deserves its, its own just like hour. <laughs> Harriet, Harriet, Harriet. 
so so that's it. That's it at the at, at zoo trip part two, <laughs> and then they go back to the Cosgroves again, and then they decide to head out to Crocodile Island again with mm-hmm. Danny. Um, and on the way, they find a message in the bottle from 20 years ago. Apparently, it's dated from 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. And Nancy is like, oh, it looks authentic. Yeah, it must be. So I put authenticating antique messages and bottles on her skill list as well. Naturally. Mm-hmm. And the message in this bottle says, Captain Wayne, USS Venerable sank in the hurricane off Argentina. 12 took to lifeboat. God's blessings. I thought this was going to be relevant. I did too. Nope. <laughs> Not relevant. I was like, oh, we're smuggling stuff to Argentina. It has something to do. Maybe there's a treasure from the shipwreck. No. No, mm-hmm. absolutely not. Really, it does it does serve a small purpose, but but we'll get to that. It's really not it doesn't seem like necessary to find a, a message in a bottle to serve this purpose, but but whatever. Um so they find that and then they make it to Crocodile Island and it is closed, but when they're there and like circling around the island, they hear like this cry for help and a man comes off of the island and swims out to their boat. He's like screaming and running, like help right. me help me. Yeah. And they pull up on they pull him up onto the boat and he his legs are like bleeding. So they're like, Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what happened? Were you attacked by a crocodile? And he was like, No. The, I guess the other staff there or his boss or something beat him with like the pole the and the hook to turn over the crocodiles. Yes. Which I would think that oh, Nancy and George and Bess immediately start like applying medical care to him. Right. And they're like, oh, should we take you to the hospital? And he's like, no, that's fine. Just drop me off at the YMCA. And <laughs> If you were, if that had really happened, you would need stitches. Like that seems like a really severe injury, really brutal treatment of him. Incredibly brutal. And he says that his boss or whoever it was, was beating him because he didn't clean the crocodile pits well enough. Mm -hmm. And then he also tells them, so he tells them a little bit more about himself, that he's from New Orleans. His name is Columbo. Um, (laughs) Of course it is. (laughs) Of course it is. And um, he got a job at Crocodile Island. But then as soon as he gets there and he starts working, they don't let him leave ever. Mm -hmm. He's he not has allowed family to leave. in the area and he can't even go see them because he- they're afraid that he'll like divulge some secret information about Crocodile Island to somebody. Right. So this is slavery again. Mm-hmm. Slavery. We get another instance of this, but they don't even really talk about it that way. They just kind of talk about it as being like, well, what a cruel thing for a boss to do. And it's like, no, 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 no. This is not just a cruel boss behavior. This is like human trafficking again. Right. You get a job and then they don't let you leave. That they don't let you quit. They don't let you physically leave the island. Mm-hmm. That's that's forced labor. It'd be weird if they just expected you to stick around in all your free time, but they're like, Oh no, you poor thing, you don't get any recreation. Like mm-hmm. no, they're being yeah. So he, yeah, he tells them about that and he also tells them that he heard Gimler or whatever his name is, Hal Gimler, mm-hmm. say to someone they want five hundred. He doesn't know what that means. He obviously can't mean crocodiles because they don't have that many crocodiles on the island. So he's just like, I heard that. I don't know what it means, but I do think they're up to something shady. So they, yeah, they drop him off or they don't even drop him off at the YMCA. They just bring him to shore and he just makes his way to the YMCA, I guess. <laughs> Which I just thought it was so funny that they mentioned the YMCA at all. Right. But I guess this was written in 78. When did Men in Hats write YMCA? Hold on. Okay. Yes. YMC- oh, Village People. Duh. Is, is what it... 1978. They released YMCA go. in 1978. <laughs> Harry's getting a cut of that, that money. She <laughs> must be. She must be. They name drop the YMCA at least three times. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so he goes off to the YMCA with his bandaged legs and they go back to the Cosgroves where uh, Mr. Gonzalez leaves a me- has left a message and called to say that he sent Nancy a letter, <laughs> which is like the modern day equivalent of texting someone to say that you left them a voicemail, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think like <laughs> an email. Go check. <laughs> so <laughs> later that night, they also get a telephone threat, which is basically just says like, oh, we know who you really are. 
Get out of Florida. <laughs> leave Florida and never come back or you'll never leave Florida. <laughs> Which is, I guess is pretty threatening. But I mean, you know, they're saying they're going to kill them. Whatever. <laughs> Um, Nancy just shrugs it off. Bess is, of course, freaked out, but George tells her to, like, not be a chicken. And Bess is like, okay. And they move George on. George is a jerk in this one. I'm sorry, but she's mean to Bess in a few different instances. Yeah, George George is, is massively mean to Bess. There's a lot of Bess call-outs for being, for being a scaredy cat and for being mm-hmm. kind of basically like a party pooper, basically. Right. But there's not as much fat shaming, I noticed. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. We've moved off to that and just general hatefulness instead. So, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> poor Bess, she can't catch a break. <laughs> she really, she really does just get the brunt of all the all the jokes. So then the next day, Nancy checks the mail because you know, per the message, she's expecting a letter. She reads the letter, and Mister <laughs> Gonzalez says that um, Hal Gimler had asked him to try to locate Colombo because they found out that he had left or whatever. And uh, Mr. Gonzalez wants to know if Nancy is the one who rescued him. And if so, can she meet him at the club and like let him know what is going on with that? So she does go to the club. She again takes pains to try to get there secretly without being followed. It's kind of frivolous and ridiculous and, and does not amount to anything. And so she talks to Mr. Gonzalez and he basically just wants to speak to Colombo in person. And so she calls Columbo and Columbo comes down to the club and tells Mr. Gonzalez about, you know, all the cruel conditions at Crocodile Island and that he's staying at the YMCA, another name drop. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And what does Mr. Gonzalez do for this? Yeah, he gives him a job or he finds a job for him. He's like, oh, well, the guy in the kitchen just quit. So you can just work here at the club. (laughs) Which now I'm like, does Mr. Gonzalez own this club? Surely not. Surely not. But I mean, maybe he is just a general business owner if he has a stake in Crocodile Island. And but yeah, maybe he just has influence because he's a member. And I guess. Yeah, maybe that makes sense, too. So yeah, Mr. Gonzalez gets a job at the club. And meanwhile, George and Bess are at the naval station asking about the uh, message in a bottle, which why would you? Oh, I guess they go to the naval station because they mentioned uh, the bottle message mentions a shipwreck, right? Mm-hmm. So that makes sense. So they're going to ask about that shipwreck, but while they're th- that has absolutely no bearing. The shipwreck right. is not important. But while they're at the naval station, they see a picture of either uh, Matt Carmen or Breck Tobin. They don't know who is who, but they see one of the guys that was in the boat in a picture on the naval station wall, I guess. And they're like, yeah. "Who is this guy?" And he's like, "Oh." that is Giuseppe Matthews and he is AWOL from the Navy and where did you see him or whatever. And they get kind of weirdly like meek about it. George is like, Oh, I don't want to get anybody in trouble. (laughs) Just in case it's not him. The guy threatening me from the boat. Maybe he's innocent. (laughs) (laughs) And um, the guy's like, well, don't worry if it's not this guy that he won't get in trouble. (laughs) Obviously. And so they tell him about, you know, that he was where he was and where they found him and everything or where they saw him. And that's that's it. Um, (laughs) This book is so weird. So they um, let's see what happens next. Is this when they go to that random beach and the child gets caught up in the waves? Yes, yes. Yeah. Where was Um, that? Were they on Key West for that? Or no, was that Key Biscayne? Yes. This was the most random part of the whole book. It makes no sense. So, yeah, they go to the beach. They Nancy saves a little girl from drowning. Of course she does. That's her that's her thing. That's yeah. her thing. And then the like there's it's like a teacher or like a school field trip or something. So. Yeah. She says, "Oh, we found this treasure map." And Nancy is like, oh, can I see a treasure map? And she looks at it and she's like, oh, if we, you know, we need a reference point or whatever. And she finds out where the treasure is supposed to be. They dig a hole. They find like some pieces of gold. If you think you know where the mystery is going at this point, you're wrong. (laughs) You are. You're absolutely wrong. Because again, 
This has no relevance to the story. We have gold doubloons. It doesn't matter, though. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Nancy gives them to the the girl, I think, who's there. And she mm-hmm. just tells them, oh, you need to make sure you take this to the authorities or whatever. You can't just mm-hmm. keep it. And and then that's it. And then they go on a tour of a lighthouse, which... <laughs> and they get this really weird story oh. from the, the tour guide of the lighthouse. and So weird. All of it was just like, what, why are you telling us all this? Like there was a, a fire at the lighthouse previously and then somebody died. I don't, I don't even remember the full story because it felt like a fever dream while I was reading it. Yep. And then at the end of that story, the tour guide teaches them how to write on a leaf with ink from a berry. This actually comes in handy later on. It does, but that's the only relevant part of this entire trip. Right. From the beach. Not saving the little girl. The little girl is never important ever again. She never comes Mm -hmm. into the story ever again. The treasure is not relevant at all. Never comes Mm -hmm. into the story ever again. The lighthouse. The story behind the lighthouse, which they devote paragraphs to. This is like three chapters of the book is this whole beach and lighthouse adventure. And then it just, it doesn't have anything to do with anything. The only part that comes, that that becomes relevant later is the fact the tour guide for this lighthouse tour teaches them that there's a certain type of leaf you can write on with a certain type of berry. Mm -hmm. That's it. For your skill book, Nancy. (laughs) Put that one in your back pocket. Right. So then they um, are on the way back, and on the way back to um, the Cosgrove's house, they see Tobin and Carmen get into a car in the middle of traffic, and so obviously they start following them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There's some great moments where Nancy's like, oh, I really don't want to break the speed limit, but I need to. And so Mm -hmm. she does break the speed limit, and then she gets pulled over by the police. Mm -hmm. I was like, ma'am, did you know you were speeding? And she was like, yes, I'm so sorry, officer, but we were following evil bad men, one of which who was AWOL from the Navy. And he says... (laughs) He says, oh, well, now that I know that you were doing a good deed, you can go. (laughs) So just for everybody out there, just FYI, you know, it's not a problem if you're caught speeding as long as you're following someone you suspect (laughs) of a crime. That's it. Oh. So they lose them. And then... (laughs) They decide to go back to Crocodile Island and they see, oh, did we mention the periscope before? I think we might have missed the periscope. I think this is the first mention of it, actually, because this is the first time I have it in my notes. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I think this is the first time we actually see it, which, why does it take so long for anything relevant to show up in this mystery? But yeah, by now we're like halfway through the book. and we- <laughs> Yeah, basically almost half of half of the book is filler is just total right total filler um but so they go back to crocodile island and it's still closed but they see a periscope in the water Mm -hmm. and they're like oh a periscope we want to follow it but then it sinks under the water and so they can't they lose it yeah this time so on so they head back because okay what i don't understand is they so this is the next day and it's really early in the morning and mm. they because I remember Danny specifically asked are you good if we go at like 6 a.m. or whatever mm. for the tides and so they do and so they get there and then they you know lose the the periscope but they haven't followed it for they have they don't follow it they just go to Crocodile Island and then it's like immediately after they lose the periscope Danny's like well, we have to go back because we're going to not make it back in time for the tide. And it's like, I thought the whole reason you went this early was so that you would have, you would be with right. the tide. Uh, but whatever. Plot hole number five? What plot yeah. Hole? Must be. <laughs> the, the deserted island? Is this that part? Right. Well, not before. They, they hit a sand bank, right? So they hit oh, a okay, sand yes. bank and they all go flying out of the, the water or mm-hmm. flying out of the boat into the water. And yeah, they're fine. But, but because they're stuck because of the tides, the low tides, they can't take the boat home. So to pass the time, they decide to wade to a nearby island and just explore. And who do they find but Efi, who has been abandoned there by himself. No one's living on this island. More animal cruelty. It's horrible. 
yeah, this this got me upset. And but he ends up okay. He's all right. But yeah. do if he like leads them to a spot where someone has buried something and they dig it up and it's a gun. They find a pistol buried in the sand. Don't worry, it's not loaded. But yeah, there's yeah, there is a really weird exchange too between George and Bess about the gun being loaded because Bess is like really freaked out. She's like mm. scared of the gun, which is a normal reaction. I was right. just have to say, and George is like, relax, it's not loaded. Rude, George. That's a that's a good question that she should ask, you know? Right. <laughs> but yeah, so they yeah, they take the gun and Efi back onto the boat. Oh, oh wait, not before After some mosquitoes <laughs> attack them. They get swarmed by mosquitoes. Like, I've never heard of this being a phenomenon. But apparently, it just reminded me of, like, you know, the giant mosquitoes in Jumanji. That's how they described it. It's just being, like, absolutely, like, encompassed in mosquitoes. And they have to flee and, like, dive into the water to get away from the mosquitoes. And then they just make it back onto the boat with the dog and the gun. And they have to, like, put on, like, you know, calamine lotion or something for, like, all of their bites. And it's like, has this person ever seen a mosquito, ever been bit by a mosquito once in their life? Because it's not like that. (laughs) It's just a, it's like an ant bite. It's like a. <laughs> right. Oh, at one point later in the story, Danny comments something about like, oh, you won't have to worry about mosquitoes because we're so close to the water. Well, what? That's where the mosquitoes are. They want to hang out by the water. What are you talking about? Yeah. I don't know how many times I can say that this book makes no sense because it literally makes no sense. It mm. makes no sense. Yeah. So they do, they do, they take, they take Effie and the gun back onto the boat and then they immediately take, um, I'm oh, sorry, Effie, not Effie, Effie to mm. the shelter where she gets adopted right away. As they're walking in, a mom and daughter are like, oh my gosh, that dog's the perfect one. Let's take him home. And so they do. Which is sweet. Happy story for, for Effie. Effie? Yeah. Effie? Effie. I think it's specific. Effie. Okay. Which is sweet and like, cool, great. I'm so glad that that dog is no longer being, you know, abused and neglected. But that just just doesn't happen. That that doesn't happen. So no. <laughs> unrealistic expectation. Just wanted to make children feel better reading it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it's fair, fair enough. <laughs> I would have been really upset. At, I mean, I was upset as an adult reading that. So as a child, I would have been distraught reading that this mm-hmm. dog had been abandoned and then no one wanted him at the shelter. So yeah, that's true. Um, and they, they also, they give the gun to the police. The next day, they go to a naval base um, to learn more about submarines because Nancy's curious about it since she thinks she saw one mm-hmm. or had seen one and meet a friend of the Cosgroves who ends up giving them a tour of a submarine. That also has no relevance. <laughs> yeah, so they go, to, they go to the naval base. He gives them a tour of a submarine. It, it's not important at all. Nancy learns where the lockers are. Oh, that helps her later. <laughs> it's bizarre. Um, and he, he lets Nancy call someone from inside the submarine. The submarine has a phone. Just weirdly, whatever. So she calls the Cosgroves to check in and say, "Hey, I, I'm calling from a submarine." <laughs> I don't know, but so yeah, she she calls the Cosgroves to check in, and Mrs. Cosgrove tells her that. Our favorite boys called Ned, Dave, and Bird, and then they want to come visit. And she's like, the more the merrier. Please have them stay here or whatever. Nancy is like, "Mm, no, actually, I want them to stay with Mr. Gonzalez, which (laughs) to act as like bodyguards for him. Which is kind of weird. She's like volunteering his house. Like, you can take my boyfriend in. Like. (laughs) Oof. Um, but so she does go to the club to like ask him if this is okay. But and mm-hmm. he he agrees. Then she meets Columbo at the club. Yes, and he says his friend Soul, he's friends with on Crocodile Island, who also worked on Crocodile Island. He says he has some kind of news from Croc Island, and he was going to head over there to his garage to talk to him. And so Nancy and the girls go with him to meet him. And Sol basically says that Gimler and Sacco, the two owners, were bragging about how much money that they were making. And he says, it's weird, though, because I know they're not smuggling crocodiles because I've seen the books and the books are fine. The books are clean, right? 
So they're not selling crocodiles under the table. He doesn't think it has to do with croc sales at all. Great. That's not really helpful, though. <laughs> it's not. But he also overheard um, the boss saying that they were going to sell Crocodile Island, which is mm. weird because Nancy knows that they previously were asking uh, Mr. Gonzalez to sell his shares to them. Right. So, so it doesn't make sense that they would try to get out as well. Yeah. Just bizarre stuff. And also, that's never really explained that no. conflicting information, even though they make a point to mention that it doesn't make sense because of what they know. <sighs> so, Don't worry. It's not relevant. So if you're confused. <laughs> so they go back to the club again. And this is when um, they are watching Mr. Gonzalez play golf mm -hmm. and they see him get hit on the head with a golf ball. Someone has putted. I don't know. Someone like on the <laughs> behind the line of the trees has putted their golf ball and it flew and hit him in the head. Yeah. Knocks him unconscious. Pretty seriously. Pretty serious injury. Nancy assumes that this is intentional. Right. There's no way this could have been an accident. So... <laughs> Um, so while people are tending to Mr. Gonzalez, she goes to chase whoever it was that had done this, who is now obviously fleeing. Mm -hmm. He gets away. <laughs> Nancy recognizes him or thinks she recognizes him as the same man who is watching them at the, the zoo area with the crocodiles there. Right. But he jumps into a car and speeds away. So, yep. And that's pretty much it. She tells the police about him. That's about it. Mr. Gonzalez ends up going to the hospital. He regains consciousness and he's okay, but he still goes to the hospital because he has a head injury. Yep. And so they're kind of like, well, that's a dead end or whatever. But then Nancy goes to talk to Columbo again. And Columbo says from her description that it sounds like this guy named Sam Yunke. Is that his name? Sure. Um, <laughs> Yunke? Yunke. Um, and he used to work at the club and also Crocodile Island. I don't know how Columbo knows that he used to work at the club since Columbo just got a job at the club. Right. But, don't worry about it, though. But he does. But also, like, the whole identity of this guy is also not relevant. Yeah. It doesn't end up mattering. <laughs> doesn't matter. <laughs> so <laughs> they go pick up the boys at the airport. <laughs> And then they all break off into couples to share kisses. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes! I had made such a massive note to talk about this. So I let's just talk about it right now because we're okay. there and I just have to talk about it. Is so, that what they said? Exchange kisses? What how do yes. they phrase it? And it is the hold on, hold on, hold on. So first of all, they say when Nancy, Bess, and George went upstairs to get ready to go meet the boys at the hospital, they gave their hair special attention and put on pretty dresses. And, um, yeah, and then they... Miami Airport was crowded, but the girls had no trouble finding the athletes from Emerson College at once. Mm -hmm. The couples paired off to exchange kisses. Scandalous. It is scandalous. This is the most, like, affection that we have seen today. Ever. Yeah. We like previously they wouldn't even call Ned Nancy's boyfriend and now they're kissing in an airport. And not just Nancy and Ned, but also, you know, Bert Bess and, and George and, and yeah, Bess and Date. Unreal. Yes. Unreal. Crazy. Harriet Harriet softens up a little bit in her later so. later editions. I so. mean, it's gotta have something to do with the time now that it's the seventies. I'm sure it was a little bit more normal. I mean, it is mm -hmm. it is normal to kiss your boyfriend at the airport, it is. But when mm -hmm. like he's not your boyfriend, you know what I mean? Right. You he's not called your boyfriend. Whatever. We don't talk about Nancy kissing anybody until now that Maybe. we've seen. Yeah, maybe this has changed. Like, maybe in some of the other more recent ones, they do eventually call Ned Nancy's boyfriend. But it just seems like, it just seems quite a jump. But that probably has something to do with the fact that we're reading them out of order. But Right. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, it's okay. So, um, yeah, they pick up the boys. And then they decide to go out to Crocodile Island. Crocodile Island, still closed. But on the way, or on the way back, they decide to stop at another uninhabited island to explore mm -hmm. for some reason. They wanted to see something. 
thing? Crocodiles or I don't no, know. No, I don't think I don't think that was the reason. It says, hold on. If we can't go ashore, we can't find out. Tell you what, suppose I take you boys to an uninhabited key so you can see exactly what one looks like. So it's just it's just to see what one looks like. Just to see what a key looks like. Yep. Okay. <laughs> So they go under the key and it's, you know, swampy and stuff. <laughs> and, um, which is weird. It's Florida. Cause, but it's supposed to be the ocean, which is also weird. And so um, while they're on the key, they see a cabin, but it's uninhabited. They see mangrove trees, whatever. Um, and as they're walking on the island, suddenly a bunch of snakes just rain down out of the trees onto them. Yeah. <laughs> Or that doesn't land on them, just on Ned. And Ned oh. is, like, getting strangled by this snake. So Bert and Dave have to go right. over and rip it off him. Which also, like, I don't think this is supposed to be an anaconda. It's, no. Or any kind of python situation. They don't say what the snakes are, but they talk about them being water snakes also. And, um, I, yeah, I, and that, like, they're black and, right. So the snake is just joking Ned out, I guess. Yep. <laughs> and uh, but they but they're able to get the snake off of Ned. Of course, Ned is not seriously harmed. This is actually how Ned dies. He's strangled by a <laughs> snake on this uninhabited key in Florida, and they leave his body and just go home. I wish that happened because that would make reading all of this random crap worth it. <laughs> At least something would come of this story. At least something interesting and relevant to the rest of our lives would would happen. <laughs> oh, Ned. Yeah. But no, Ned's fine. He's fine. They get the snakes off. They leave the island. And that's it. And then they notice a police boat driving by. And they're like, oh, where's the police boat going? It looks like it's headed to Crocodile Island. Should we go? And they're like, yeah. So they follow the police boat, and they get to the island where it's being searched by police, and they Mm -hmm. offer to help in the search. Yeah, they decide to go around the back of the island, see if anyone's trying to escape that way. Mm -hmm. And the the, um, police tell tell them that they've arrested most most of the people on the island right or most of the workers on the island but they're still missing a couple of them Mm -hmm. two people got away on the whisper and then they think there's two more hiding out somewhere on the island right Mm -hmm. yeah and so they kind of split up they split up into their couple teams and George and Bert go off into the woods and end up finding those two Mm -hmm. and Bess and Dave they don't really talk about what they're doing but Nancy and Ned find the submarine that has surfaced on one part of the island, and they decide to climb into it. Well, they see two guys get out of it oh. and like run away and go right. off, and they're like, well, let's go down and see what's going on in that. So they jump into the submarine. So stupid. So stupid. <laughs> Hey, we know these smugglers, uh, they're smuggling something. We don't know what it is. Could be crocodiles. Mm-hmm. Could could be, they've previously sent us death threats. So. Could be drugs. Could be anything. They've threatened to kill us multiple times. They've kidnapped us. We just saw them hop off this submarine. Let's get on it. Just like the most ridiculous decision-making skills I've ever seen. But and even like while there are police on the island, should you not just go to the police or like somehow sabotage the submarine so they can't get back on it or, Mm -hmm. or something, but no, um, they get in the submarine, but not before Nancy leaves a note on a leaf so that Uh. people will know where they, they went. But also like, that's not really relevant either because Bess and uh, Bess and George see that Nancy get onto the submarine. Mm hmm. And so, and see her leave the message on the the leaf. So they know Mm -hmm. where she went. They don't have to read the message on the leaf to know where she went. Right. So it wasn't wasn't even relevant to the end at all. It wasn't. Not helpful. And it's not like about five minutes later, the (laughs) bad guys come back and then get on the submarine. And then in Syria, you're like, oh, we have to hide in these lockers. So, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but in those lockers, they like push the clothes aside and there's like ammo and explosives and grenades back there. And they're like, must be what they're smuggling. But no, 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 it's not not. being smuggled either. (laughs) 
It is high definition cameras. Cameras. Just gonna pause for a moment and let that sink in. All of this hullabaloo, all of it, is because these people are smuggling high definition cameras. I mean, so Ned and Nancy like hide themselves on the submarine, and the bad guys come back and just start laying out this whole plan. They'd stolen these cameras from Connecticut, brought them all the way down to Florida, and then Why? they're planning to to ship them to Mexico. And the five hundred that was referenced earlier, they needed five hundred extra cameras. What? And like that's it. Like that's the story. There's. Nothing else to that story. They're just smuggling cameras, which like we knew they were smuggling something at like the very beginning. Well, close to the beginning of the story. Mm-hmm. That's it. I thought it was going to be like somehow tied into the pirates or nope. the shipwreck. No, nope, nope. Not even, not even tied into crocodiles. Really, right? Which is the freaking title of the the book. The guys who did it just happened to own a crocodile farm as well. <laughs> it could have been anything else. It right. could have been any other kind of business. It didn't even have to be a business. It could have just been somebody's house. Right. Why? Uh, Smuggling cameras. And I, like I had assumed that like, okay, it's because they're laundering the money through this business. No, they're not. The books are clean. They're not mm. laundering money. They just need somewhere to store their stolen cameras while they sell them to someone in Mexico. And apparently they're storing them in their submarine. <laughs> I know. It really it really doesn't make any sense. And that's yeah, that's really the end the end of the story. We don't actually even see the rescue from the submarine. Ned and Nancy are just rescued from the submarine by the Coast Guard, but we mm-hmm. only get that second hand from Bess and George and, and Dave and, and Bert while they're on the island with the police. That was really disappointing where yeah. like, they get trapped in the submarine and they start going off to Mexico and then it's just like, oh, and then they come back because the police brought them back. Right. And Bess and George got word that they're fine now. We don't get any of the hot action from like the whole like setup of the scary situation of them being trapped in the submarine with the bad guys. We don't get to see it. Even the summary at the very beginning of the book where it's like teasing what's going to happen mentions that they get trapped in the submarine and it's supposed to be this exciting lead up to it. Let down. That's it. They're fine. Major let down. But yeah, so they they end up going back to, you know, the Cosgroves and have their little happy reunion with everybody and everything. And we learn that Mr. Gonzalez is purchasing all of Crocodile Island, taking over Crocodile Island, and making Soul and Colombo managers. Manager and assistant manager. Yeah. Oh, right. Assistant manager. I have thoughts about that too. <laughs> oh, wow. Happy story ending. Yep. So that's that's mystery of Crocodile Island in a nutshell. Now let's talk about the nitty gritty. <laughs> let's get into it. Yeah. <laughs> because because like the craziness of the plot aside, like truly crazy, truly just absolutely filled with plot holes, truly doesn't make any sense, truly is totally irrelevant, uh, and also like like a letdown. Like it's mm-hmm. not it's not exciting. You know, it's like it would make sense for you to introduce all of these different things if it made for a good story. Right. It doesn't really. It doesn't really. It kind of fails. It had so much potential. They set up so many (laughs) exciting potential plot lines and then we don't investigate it any further. Yeah. And I was so I was so upset that we didn't get more crocodiles. Like there should have been a crocodile in every chapter. You know what I mean? But really, truly, the only crocodile encounter we have is not even on Crocodile Island. It's on the Cosgrove's neighbor's, like, weird backyard zoo. Right. And that wasn't even that scary because there was a guy, like, a trainer there the whole time, and Nancy did a stupid thing by jumping into the crocodile's enclosure. Right. And the whole time, Bess is, like, you know, making hints, like, foreshadowing about, oh, these crocodiles are so dangerous and I'm scared of them. And then they don't really even have anything, any encounters besides the, right. Nancy's dumb move. So. so on top of all of the banana stuff with the plot is there's also just, like, the most the most bizarre, the most confusing, and also, like, 
contentious thing first said. So I mean, let's I mean, let's just jump right into <laughs> where do we start? Okay. The racism, I think I think okay. is the thing we just have we just cannot ignore. Good call. And, yeah, and it's hard. It's hard to start talking about it because there is almost so much packed into this book. So I guess I guess we should start talking about the the very first character that we meet, which is Joe, the trainer who is seminal. And I, I at first I thought, you know, we were we were kind of trending in a pretty good direction because we were getting kind of Joe's description of his background and he was describing where he's from, from the Everglades and talking about his family and why he enjoys being this animal trainer. And so I thought that that was promising because it didn't seem like they were trying to shoehorn or even stereotype, generalize or stereotype the character of Joe. And, you know, we we learned of like a a legit Native American tribe. Like this, it didn't seem, it didn't seem fake. They do call him the Indian, but outside of that, I mean, which we've seen before, but outside of that, it did seem relatively okay for an answer to your book so right but and also they called they called him that before they knew his name i think okay okay which makes which makes a little bit of a difference but yeah Mm -hmm. he's still not great but so we find that but then literally not even like two paragraphs later um we get the part where nancy sees the guy she's jumped out of the enclosure she sees Mm -hmm. the guy or she talks about how she saw the guy watching them and I'm I'm just going to read it because it really is the most baffling. It's just the most, it's phrased so strangely. Where Nancy didn't want to hurt his feelings. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> they also mention, uh, this, this one did irk me. They mentioned that Joe speaks English fluently, mm. which was really irrelevant <laughs> because obviously he speaks English fluently. You're talking to him right now. Like you. Right. You don't have it, it was it was a racist call out. OK, so there she's talking about the guy that she saw. And George asks, what did he look like? And she says he had long black hair, small eyes and looked like an Indian. Nancy whispered, not wishing to hurt Joe's feelings. What is that about? Just signaling that it's bad to look like an Indian and would therefore hurt someone's feelings to be. I yeah. Don't know. Like, yeah. That's my only guess. Either that or that somehow remarking on someone's like characteristics, physical characteristics is in some way bad. But yeah, but that would mean that the physical characteristics themselves are bad. Right. And something to be embarrassed about. Yeah. It. Mm. So. <laughs> so there's that. And that is pretty much it about Joe. But we do have more racism with the man who she's describing there. I don't, I don't remember his name again, but um, the guy who was watching them. Right. So. Yeah. We don't actually get his name until much later from Columbo who, who mentions mm-hmm. it, but it's, yeah, it's really not relevant. It's not, he never comes back into the story, but yeah, she, when she's describing him to the police after he has fled after hitting Mr. Gonzalez with the golf ball, she multiple times calls him a half breed. Yes. And not only that, but she's like, oh, well, he's got dark hair, beady eyes. He looks like he's a half breed. And then the police are like, oh, well, that's more than most people would have noticed. Mm -hmm. All she noticed was his race. And they're like, excellent description. We'll be able to find him. No problem now. Yeah. And I do, I do want to apologize too. And we should probably put a trigger warning on this episode because like, I know that that term has got to be really, uh, really triggering for, oh, yeah. for people who, you know, have, have bad experiences with, with it. <laughs> so, right. um, yeah. So sorry. We're really sorry if, if that is, that's, uh, triggering you. It's really ugly. It race. is really, really ugly. Really ugly way to describe. I remember character. when I read it, when I saw it on the page, I literally gasped. I was like, I was so shocked, so shocked Mm -hmm. that in 1978, I mean, admittedly, I don't, obviously, I don't know what it was like in 1978, but I guess the fact that any time that that would be a term that you would use to describe someone is shocking to Mm -hmm. me now. So, yeah. Oh, it's so gross. It's so offensive. And just to think of what the implications were for that, for the police to, oh, let's go look for a man who looks vaguely seminal. Right, right. And assume that he is this attacker. Because yeah. all he's really accused of is hitting a golf ball, and, mm-hmm. you know, like, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. So, so really, so really gross, really gross language there. 
But then there was also something really curious that I don't know if you picked up on, Corey, but that I noticed in regards to Soul and the the Lighthouse story. So we, we get mm-hmm. two references to Black people and both of them, like at first I was like, okay, like why are you, it just seemed really irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Like it seemed, it seemed like a really strange call out. And also, you should know a black man was there. Like, right. What? Yeah, what? Yeah, yeah. what? Okay. <laughs> so Columbo says, like, uh, he's talking about Soul, his friend on the island. He goes, and Soul, my friend, who is a black guy and a great guy. Mm-hmm. Don't worry. He's really nice. Don't worry. He's black, but he's nice. It's like, what the frick? Yeah. yeah. So there's that. But then also with the lighthouse story, they're talking, yeah, they're talking about this guy who was working at the lighthouse. John Thompson, I think. And right. And his black assistant. Right. Doesn't That's get a it. name. Mm-hmm. Doesn't get a name, but also like doesn't have a role really in the story either. It's just. He's there to be killed is his role in the story. He's right. killed and it doesn't matter because don't worry, the white guy was okay in the end. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, they just like, there's nothing else about him that we know, except for his race. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, what (laughs) the F? (sighs) So, yeah, I I mean, honestly, Mm. it's it's hard to know what to say. And it's it's like, after reading these books, you know, like a, a lot of them, we've noticed a fair bit of racism you know, in each of them. But like, I have to say that like, this seemed to be the most egregious to me. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the almost the latest published ones in 1978. Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't know why, how I don't know how that could be the case. And, And maybe, you know, maybe it just reads differently, you know, now, I mean, obviously, it reads differently now versus 1978. But I mean, like, I don't, I don't, obviously I'm not versed in what kind of like race theory and what kind of, what talking about race at that time was like. Right. So maybe, I don't know, maybe it would have read differently to someone who, who who wasn't racist (laughs) at the time. You know, I don't know. Maybe this was progressive compared to what other stuff was on the market at the time. You know, maybe this was better than, I mean, I hope not. I, uh, yeah, yeah. So it, it's really it, this one really does not rank high for me you know i was i was really hoping to like go into it with uh, i thought it would be fun yeah it's just a crocodile story <laughs> instead you know we get we get this on almost like every other chapter it seemed like something racist was happening mm-hmm. and also none of the plot made sense and all like also it was just it was just, it was just really disappointing I'm interested to see how the Nancy Drew files are going to be different when we move mm-hmm. on to that series, because it, it's it's very close in time to these, because that started in the 80s, and this is 78, true. so hopefully it's we true. won't see as egregious examples of racism. I'm sure there will be a few, but... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really excited about that, too. I'm sure we'll move on to some homophobia as well. Oh, in, yeah. In the 80s. But... Oh, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, do we want to talk about gender and class in this book as well? Yo, yeah, for sure. For sure. So, Danny, a few times someone voices concern about Nancy or about Nancy and her friends. And it's always like, don't worry, we've got a 16 year old boy with us. Don't yeah. worry, we have this boy to protect us. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Nancy, how- yeah. Nancy's always bringing him up as like, yeah, we have a, we have a boy with us. We have a boy with us, but he's also like he's sixteen, mm-hmm. but he's supposed to be an authority or supposed right. to be more capable in some way. And it's not even like oh, because he's from this area and he knows his way around and he'll help no. you if you get lost. No, this is a protection thing. Like he'll be there if the bad guys come back with their guns and their grenades and their. <laughs> And I mean, it's also very convenient, the fact that right at the end of the story, right when, you know, bigger action is going to start to happen, our boys from River Heights have to come down Mm -hmm. for a visit. To literally play bodyguard. Not for Nancy, but... Well, yeah, no, yeah, she literally says she wants them to protect Mr. Gonzalez. That doesn't end up happening. Mm -hmm. But 
and and on the island they pair off with one girl one boy one girl mm-hmm. one boy it feels so i have to say like this book just feels like such a departure from the earlier books Mm -hmm. like it just feels so different and it's it does not seem to me like it this is an issue of 1950s versus 1970s right because it seemed to me like those gender norms would be worse in the 50s right and yet it's not if i'm being totally honest (laughs) seems to me like like harriet is not it is not great at this. No, she's, she's at, well, from our, our episode on this, we know the history. Now she's firmly got her hold on Nancy by this point. She's been the sole writer for a while now. Um, this is actually her third, no fourth to last book. She does write three mm-hmm. more after this. And I guess it's just starting to slip yeah. a little bit. So. And like at this point, at this point, nobody else is contributing to these books. Like she's the sole author. And editor, I think. Yeah. yeah and editor. And so it just seems like, were the quality is really not what it was right i feel like in the past we've had like oh well ned's with you so you'll be okay you've got a boy with you but this is nancy saying like no i'll be okay because this child is here and he's male so don't worry (laughs) yeah yeah it's just disappointing yeah yeah also how does nancy and bess and george just happen to show up any anywhere that they need to stay or get a room or like you know these people are they're gonna stay with these people or these friends of Carson. They always have three open guest rooms. Oh, or at yes. least two in Bess and George share, but how? Well, I think this t- I mean you you mentioned class before, and this mm-hmm. ties, you know, definitely ties into the class discussion. We get the very strong idea that Carson and Nancy are both wealthy, and mm-hmm. so they have wealthy friends. And whenever they go to stay places, yeah, there's, there's multiple rooms and there's a large room for Bess and George and, Mm -hmm. and they don't all have to sleep in the same room. There's multiple rooms and Carson's friend's friend has friends who also are in, you know, are members of that golf club and have friends who live on an estate who own a zoo. These are different (laughs) friends, not the same rich friend, multiple rich people. And so Nancy is really just an agent for, for you know rich people's mysteries basically Mm -hmm. you know and solves them according to you know their expectations and their ideals and uh, even yeah even mr gonzalez you know he's a member of the club he's a business owner he owns you know shares of this company like he's a wealthy guy she's investigating for him Mm -hmm. but i mean what about soul and colombo you know i just think about them Honestly, when you think about the crimes in this book, we have smuggling is what what is what we're supposed to consider is the main story, right? Mm-hmm. We're supposed to consider that smuggling is is the true reason why these guys are being arrested or whatever. But when actually if we look at Sol and Colombo's story of them going to work at this place and then being beaten, mm-hmm. being trapped, kidnapped, enslaved, forced to work, like those are like human rights violations. Not allowed to contact your family. Right. Like that is a much greater crime. And just mm-hmm. because they're not the ones who hire Nancy or not even hire because she's not even paid. Mm-hmm. She doesn't investigate that. She's just like, oh, how cruel. She, The only person she tells about that is Mr. Gonzalez. Right. She doesn't tell the police that. The police don't know about that. The police are after them because one of them's AWOL from the Navy. And they might be smuggling. They might be smuggling. That's it. When really it's like. That's not even the worst thing happening here. <laughs> and if you think about like them getting charged for this essentially financial crime, mm-hmm. they're not going to get what? I don't know. I maybe no idea. what kind of criminal uh, sentence? Yeah, sentence they would get from that. But it seems like if you have someone who's like physically abusing workers and mm-hmm. forcing workers to work and not being able to leave, like that's that's, that's a much worse crime here. Yeah. But, you know, because they're lower class and not white, their problems don't matter as much. Apparently. Right. It just seems like it seems like the message that we get is, I mean, obviously it, Nancy's like, oh, this is terrible. This is cruel or whatever. But like, ultimately, it seems like, well, you get you get what you deserve. 
You know mm. what I mean? Like you needed to work and that's the job. Right. So. <laughs> what was the gun used for? The one we that they know. find with Efi. We don't know. It yeah. was just an empty gun buried on the beach and we find no other information about it. Yeah. I think it was supposed to be one of those situations that is just supposed to heighten the drama because there's a gun involved. Yeah. And But it was weird because also Bess... Bess was like scared about it, but George brushed it off like it was no big deal. So it seemed really conflicting. Like it's like if you want it to be a big deal, make it be a big deal, like to everybody. Right. But they didn't do that. Oh, more on the rooms thing with the class thing. Even in the house that they're kidnapped to and taken at the very beginning, that has three extra, like really extravagant guest rooms as well. So Mm -hmm. we never find out whose house that was or. Like, was it owned by one of the people involved with this whole racket? I don't know. Yeah, Nancy says that, like, she doesn't think it belongs to the kidnappers because they wouldn't be so stupid as to take us to their own residence. Mm -hmm. But then, like, so, yeah, whose house is it? We don't get, why don't you investigate that house? If they're using that house, maybe it belongs to somebody that they're involved with that they know that is also somehow involved in this crime, but they don't. They just completely drop it. We do find out those people get arrested, though, the people that show up at the airport and Mm -hmm. kidnap them at the very beginning. And their daughter, who was posing as Nancy's assumed name and fooled Mr. Gonzalez at the club, I guess they're also living on the island. But we don't know that until until the police tell us at the end. Yeah. A lot more reliance on the police in this one than there was in the the past ones. Yeah, there was. Yeah, Nancy definitely did a lot of calling the police, a lot of telling the police stuff. Which, yeah, was interesting. So on kind of a random different note, Mm -hmm. Nancy at the beginning of this book is described as being a strawberry blonde. Oh, yeah. Which I thought was fascinating. Mm -hmm. Neither Titian haired uh, nor just blonde. She is now strawberry blonde, which I think makes sense of the time. You know, Titian's kind of an old fashioned old-fashioned term. And strawberry means reddish blonde, which which is what it is. Um, so that's so in the 1970s, that's when we, we get that. We get the strawberry blonde term. I'm glad you said that something else happens at the beginning that was interesting. Oh, is it about Hannah? Because I have something to say about Hannah. Oh, I don't think it was, but I forgot she was even in this story. She's in it very briefly. She freaks out about the crocodile. But she is described as having plenty of courage. Oh, and yeah. I'm just like, in what universe does Hannah have plenty of courage? She is always supposed to be the one who is like, oh, Nancy, don't go. Nancy, I'm so worried for you. Nancy, be please be careful. Yeah. <laughs> Nancy, make sure you take your dad with you so that, you know, nothing bad happens. Nancy, make sure you come home before dark so nothing bad happens. How does Hannah have plenty of courage? I found it, yeah, plenty of courage when confronted with a crisis. Okay, Hannah. And it's not, they're not even just talking about the crocodile situation. It's like, okay, maybe Hannah is really good with, you know, animal crises or whatever. No, they just describe her as being um, a middle-aged woman who had plenty of courage when confronted with a crisis. They also describe her as Mrs. Hannah Gruen, implying Mm. that she's married or is a widow, which we didn't know this about Hannah before. I don't think we knew this about her before, but. Yeah. I don't know yet. I've never noticed that before. Interesting. So goes in this one as well. He is, and he's described as being a bull terrier, which I think is different than what uh, we've previously seen. I can't remember I can't if it's either. a fox terrier or it's some. It's a different type of terrier or an English fox terrier or something. Um, but that's diff- a different terrier than a bull terrier. A bull mm-hmm. terrier is like a really distinctive really distinctive look Mm -hmm. so interesting interesting descriptions in this one see bess and george i would just say that like a lot of the detective work and good ideas seem to come from george Mm -hmm. which is just kind of weird because it's like if you're writing a a series about a girl detective and her girl best friends come along. Like maybe you should give all the good detective bits to your girl detective. Right. Instead of having like George be the one whose idea it was to go to the Naval Academy or whatever. It's like Nancy should be the one to bring that up. And Nancy probably would have been the one to bring it up in maybe an earlier book. But Mm -hmm. for some reason, some of those lines and stuff are given to George, Mm -hmm. which I thought was strange. 
it's not that George is completely useless. It's just I wouldn't be the one to describe her as the the one with like the ideas. Right. I would say she's athletic and she's prepared, which is similar yes. to Nancy. But in other situations, we've seen kind of George be the one to let, jump in without thinking. Mm-hmm. Best to hold back. Nancy to be in the middle with the level headed, right? Yeah. You know, that's that's supposed to be our our meter, right? <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. Yeah, but other than that, and the kissing the boys, there's not a super lot I, I had to say about Bess and George. Oh, George did have an unreal reaction to the crocodile like origin story. So Danny is telling them about the story of like how crocodiles got to the island is apparently because they were blown over from Africa in a hurricane or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, oh, oh, sorry, from Cuba or but maybe Africa. And mm-hmm. George says, uh, "If I see that in a science book, I'll believe it, but not from hearsay." Well, good for you, George. Yeah, but it also seemed like racist a little bit because i think he talks about it being yeah the story comes from the indians is what right. Danny says and so it's like george being like well i'm not gonna believe that story because it's not in a science book written by mm. white people right you know like <laughs> cannot handle it cool story george keep it to yourself exactly <laughs> yeah shut your gosh dang mouth like George does seem, one, really aggressive towards Bess, and two, also really, like, petulant. Mm -hmm. Like, she seems, like, annoyed with a lot of the stuff that happens with that story, and, yeah, with Bess a lot being scared. She's like, oh, you're such a chicken, and we're going to have to put you in a coop because you're a chicken, and just being, like, snotty. Yeah, she's a little snotty. I didn't like it. I did not like it. And, I mean, Bess is, like, quelled from that. Mm-hmm. Like, she's like, oh, no, I'm not going to be a chicken. And she's like, oh, well, I guess I will come along or whatever. It's like she's being bullied. To. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty It's pretty intense. I think that's almost everything that I have. Yeah, I have some, like, weird random comments about, like, outdoor phones. Oh. <laughs> I thought that was weird. I didn't know that was a thing. I mean, I know, like, pay phones are a yeah. thing, obviously. But, like... The- the house that they go to after they're kidnapped to try to find a phone has an outdoor phone and the people aren't home, but thank goodness they have an outdoor phone that they can use to call the police. Right. Let's see. Oh yeah. So yeah, this is another best George, like snotty moment from George because George and Nancy are wanting to go back out on the boat. And Bess is like, do you think we all have to go? Because Mrs. Cosgrove promised to show me how to make her lemon nut cake. Oh, yeah. And I don't want to pass up that opportunity, is what she says. And George says, if you'd rather cook than be a detective, you're welcome to stay home. Rude. And Bess could not stand her cousin's condescending tone. On second thought, I'll postpone my culinary education. She already had plans, and she got bullied into changing them because George thought that that was the more worthwhile thing to do. And also, like, I can see how, like, you know... This is like almost like Harriet Stratemeyer Adams' uh, idea of feminism at the mm-hmm. time is like women bullying women to be more adventurous or more independent or more exciting or whatever. But Bess doesn't want to. Bess wants to learn a new recipe while she's right. on vacation. <laughs> she's like, <laughs> she's allowed to do. And, and instead we get George being this bad girl, bad mm-hmm. girl influence of like trying to get her to go be a detective. It's just bizarre. It's just weird. Bess never said she wants to be a detective either. So why? Yeah. Right. And also like it seems like in this book, we're supposed to think that, I mean, Nancy is our protagonist. Nancy is a detective. Nancy's our main character. We're supposed to admire Nancy for her detectiving. Right. But instead we get George using it in like this weirdly threatening way. Like, Mm -hmm. uh, like "Mm, you need, you need to be a detective. And so that makes us think badly of that. Right. You know, it is weird. Interesting. But yeah, no, I mean, just what, just what a cluster, just what a cluster of a book. Very bizarre. Yeah. So do you want to rate it? (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think we even need to, but I think we can guess what our flashlight rating will be. I'm going to give it a one. 
Yeah, I would give it a one, too. I will say that it is definitely a read that kept my attention. Yeah. And for that, maybe I'd give it a two. But not for any good reason. It was more of just like me being like, well, what the heck is going to happen next? Right. That is going to make me gasp out loud. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the open racism, the random plot, the kissing at the airport (laughs) (laughs) or something snarky and mean that George says to Bess, like, what is it going to be? So, I mean, Mm -hmm. if that's your vibe, you know, maybe you'd enjoy it. I don't know. (laughs) Maybe if the ending had been a little bit more satisfying. Yeah. If it made more sense, it would have gotten a higher score for me, but it's just cameras that were smuggling to Mexico for no reason. And it felt kind of like, a mashup between Danger on Deception Island and mm. Ransom of the Seven Ships, where we've got oh, this yeah. smuggling thing going on, but also we're on a beach on an island and nothing is making sense. Nothing in the mystery is, is going right. And also racism. And also racism, yes. <laughs> I don't like Ransom of the Seven Ships for a lot of reasons, and both of those are among them. I mean, yeah, I definitely don't like Ransom of the Seven Ships for racism right <laughs> but i didn't i didn't mind it the mystery so much i thought it was okay better than some i thought i just didn't like how it's like we give you one suspect and then you're going to be surprised oh, at the end who it is and then it's not even a new suspect that's not what happens in this book obviously but we do get <laughs> i mean in a kind of similarly that we just don't i mean it's like they're smuggling yeah mm-hmm. that's it <laughs> they're smuggling <laughs> You know, it's not really mysterious. When they found the doubloons, I was like, oh, we're going to find a a sea captain's journal like El Toro. And he's going to lead us to the sunken treasure. And the crocodiles are being used to bring up the treasure. And that's what's in the crate. No. Yeah, I was like, yes, finally, pirates, pirate treasure, pirate ship, pirate wreck. I'm for this. Absolutely not. So it's really disappointing. I do wonder... I mean, we have so many Nancy Drew books. At this point, we're in number 55. There are so many more after this, you know, Mm -hmm. so many more series, just so much. I do slightly wonder how they keep coming up with anything new that I feel like at a certain point, you're going to have to recycle some old themes, Mm -hmm. plots, that kind of thing, because there's there's just so many. There's just so many. But there's a lot you can do with it and still let it make sense, you know? Like, yeah. smuggling can be a, a smuggling story and be better than what this was, so. Yeah. I keep saying I'm so excited for the Nancy Drew Files, but it's true. I'm so excited for the Nancy yes. Drew Files because I think we get a lot more character drama, mm-hmm. which is what I am here for. Um, and I am really ready to move past some of these just, like, absolutely inane plots <laughs> and like just action, 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 action to get into a little bit more, you know, character development. Yeah. You know, learn a little bit more about Nancy and her relationships. Yeah. Particularly of the romantic kind. Mm-hmm. But we're not getting into the Nancy Drew Files just yet. Not just yet. Do we want to say our, our next book? So next we are going to be reading The Clue in the Diary, number seven hopefully learn a little bit more about our Ned Stiffer and where he has sprung from. <laughs> this is going to be a good one. Yeah. thought we are going to get any kisses in this one, but we'll, yeah, we'll get to meet him and see yeah. how, how it bloomed. How it all started. <laughs> Origin story of, of our Ned Stiffer. I feel like that is important, an important one to get to, especially if yes. we're going to be going into the files to really get the beginning of mm-hmm. the Ned and Nancy relationship to know what we will get to, you know? Mm-hmm. Cool. So for our next episode, After the Clue in the Diary, we aren't going to tell you what we're going to be covering just yet, but we do have a clue for you in the form of our June puzzle. We're going to be posting a scrambled message on our social media accounts tomorrow, Saturday morning. So head on over there and see if you can figure it out. Yeah, see you then. Thank you for listening to Regular Nancy Drew. Email us at regularnancydrew at gmail.com. If you liked this episode, make sure to rate, review, and subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram at regularnancydrew and Twitter at regularnd. 
You can also support us on Patreon. Patrons at the $1 level receive early access to each episode as well as weekly bonus content. And to all you regular Drews out there, thanks for listening. 